everyone, and welcome to Graphic Content. It's been a while, but we're back, and we've come here with two brand new titles that are, we're going to talk about that we're excited about. Um, this week, Dave suggested The Vision to me, and I had heard a lot about this book working at Hub Comics, but I hadn't read it, and I read it, and it was really interesting. It's a, it's a good book. Yeah. yeah. Why, why did you choose it, Dave? Um, I chose it because I picked it up after all the Christmas birthday weirdness. Uh, of the past few months. This was on my short list of stuff to pick up. It, it made a few top 10 lists hmm. of stuff from last year. Uh, it came highly recommended from some people that I trust, and so I was, I picked it up, loved it. Um, it's a really good story. Yeah, yeah. Both you and I were not familiar with the vision. Yeah, The yeah. character, of the, it, this is a Marvel book, uh, B BTW. Um, and a, as a part of the Marvel Universe, um, it's the same universe as Spider-Man and Iron Man and you know, the, who, Avengers the Avengers. And, and they kind of make guest appearances throughout it all. Right. Um, but it's really not your average superhero comic no. in the least. Um, like Breaking Bad. Like It felt mm -hmm. like, like um, that sort of anti-hero craziness. Um, applied to this supernatural character who, yeah. how would you describe the vision? Okay, so he is very quick to point out that he is not a robot. He is a sentinel, there is a specific term I put in the email. He's like the son of a cosmic being that is made in the, uh, to, to resemble a human, but he's not a human. Right. But he's not a robot either. He's like a symbiotic cos being. But I thought I, I the more I thought about it, the more it made it, it helped that his origins were complicated, right? Because he is other. I think that's the kind of the point of it. He is right, and there's definitely that element. Yeah, yeah. The book is a lot play. about people attempting to gain normalcy. Mm -hmm. The whole point, uh, the vision, this sentient cosmic being from another who was made by Gal uh, Galactus or something. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, Ultron. Vision is a Synthesoid, an android composed of synthetic human blood and organs. He was created by Ultron to destroy the Avengers, but instead turned on his father. And he's been a member of the superhero team ever since. Right, and, uh, and in this book, he's attempting to gain a sense of normalcy by creating a family first and moving to the suburbs of Virginia. Um, yes, yeah. So there's this very, like, you have the whole nuclear family, suburban kind of drama going on that's, that's it's not really at the forefront, but it's definitely the backdrop of, mm -hmm. of the thing. And then you have um, superhero elements that come to play, obviously. And then you have a psychological drama. The eternal question of like what it is to be human uh, being asked by this being who isn't quite fully human and yeah. his family that he created. He literally yeah. created his family. And he attempts to uh, solve problems in an algorithmic algorithmic ways. Yep. Um, however, you know, life can't really be charted in an equation. And he comes to these logical conclusions that would be the complete opposite of what humans do. Right. Um, yeah. And like the discussions that he has with his wife, um, mm -hmm. where he's trying to get her to understand his sense of logic. Um, and they there's kind of like a, I, I almost thought they were a little abusive towards the wife, the conversations, because he was like really pressing her to come to this conclusion, and she was resisting in a very human way. And um, so in, the, in that sense, he has a really kind of rigid sense of the world, of very black and white, and he's trying to impose that on his family. Very binary. Yeah, and very zero binary, one. totally. Yeah. Um, and his family, you know, the, the kids are high schoolers, so they're going through that. Um, the wife is a housewife, and she essentially just sits at home and waits for everybody to come home. Um, and so there, there's this uh, big kind of discrepancy between the reality that his family is experiencing and the, um, the, dichot the dichotomy uh, that the vision is presenting to them in a very kind of rigid way. Yeah. And so there's, therein lies the tension of the book. The other tension too is their desire for normalcy, which is why they're there in the first place. And I should also point out, they're not just, uh, not robots, excuse me, they're 
synthetic synthesoids. 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 There's a big difference. Synthesoids. Um, they're superheroes, and they have exceptional powers. They're super yep. smart. They can fly. They can go through walls, and that scares people. And I thought that was really interesting. A part about being normal is not being exceptional. You can't be exceptional and be normal at the same time. Right. You know. So. Right. Uh, what I thought was really interesting is their superpowers are seen as a threat mm -hmm. to, the s to the community. Um, for example, the son has your average tussle with a schoolyard chum, but because he's a superhero, he, almost, he puts this boy in a coma. And this unfortunate circumstance leads to an even worse circumstance. We won't go, I don't want to spoil yeah, anything. Like the terrible scenarios just, just kind of pile so up. Well. Yeah. And, um, and a lot of it has to do because their community won't accept them. Right. They're seen as a threat for being different. But it also goes back to the binary worldview that's imposed on them. Yeah. So, like, um, one of the family members tries to cover up this really horrible act and uh, in doing so worsens the situation until it becomes something, uh, until it blows up into something horrible, uh, even more horrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, getting back to the writing, um, I thought it was really, what was really clever was, especially in the first scene where you have like neighbors coming over to offer some sort of neighborly gesture, I forget what it was, like um, flowers or something, mm -hmm. introducing themselves and it's like this old human couple and they're, they're talking about their, their reservations as they um, knock on the door of, of the visions and then you, see, you, then you see their encounter, you encounter it with them and you get a tour of their house. And then, um, and then you find out, it's not really a spoiler because it comes in the first chapter, and it's also the intent of the, uh, the writers. You find out at the end of the chapter that um, they both die horribly, um, and that the, hmm. the woman visiting them, her last thought is of like an exotic alien floating vase that was in the house. Um, and I just thought that that, that kind of got me hooked on the story, mm -hmm. like, oh, this is going to be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the format of the comic and the way it was published, I think it came out like every two weeks, at, like uh, an issue at a time. Okay. Kind of like usually that's how Marvel does. Um, it's episodic in the same way that uh, uh, Portrait of a Lady is episodic, like published in the Atlantic or Great Expectations that is episodic. Right. And so they cover a lot of um, subject matter in it, I think. Like there's the... Uh, it's kind of hard to not look at parallels between racial tensions and class tensions in America that you can't, it, it, it's not an exact metaphor, but it's there. It, right. ri it rhymes, so to right. speak. Um, but then uh, going forward, and, and, and another sm small story arc, it gets into the binary thing. It's talking about the N and the NP. Mm -hmm. that's, the vo that's the writing over top of it. Right. Um, <clears throat> So there's a lot to chew in here. It kind of like feels like it's got one foot and like Philip K. Dick, what does it mean to be human? But it is still kind of contemporary, really addressing um, how politicized the suburbs is as an environment and like who is allowed there and who is not allowed mm -hmm. there. Um, and you know, the futility, I think. I think the overall theme pit for me was the futility of trying to conform and how it's impossible. Right. There is no normal because, uh, I mean, some people have an easier time, you know, it, fitting into society than others. But if you look at the whole planet, it's relative. There is no normal. And so is no matter how much he studies it, the algorithms, life is just too random to predict it, I suppose. Right. You know? Yeah. So there's a lot there because it's like, it's kind of chapter based. And while there is this one long or story arc that's going on, it kind of touches on a lot of different things, I think, yeah. you know? Yeah. And that point is reinforced um, throughout the book, but also like the, the son character mm -hmm. is study he's infatuated with Shakespeare. Yeah. Oh, and, I mean, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And he keeps repeating uh, the line, reoccurring lines from a particular Shakespeare play. Um, you know, I, am, I, am I not a man? Um, and I know I'm botching it, but um, if, <coughs> if, you, if you cut me, do I not bleed? Um, and so those, those lines um, are famous outside of Shakespeare because they, they speak towards humanizing people for whom you might have a prejudice against. Mm -hmm. And then so, you know, it's, it's one of the, the reoccurring things in this book to reinforce that, that point. If you're not 
up to date with the Marvel Universe, there are moments that can feel confusing. Um, for example, the Scarlet Witch, um, his origins. I'm, I'm still a little, it's a little, it's a little all over the place. If you have a little sense of the Marvel Universe, there's like a whole thing. Yeah, yeah, you don't really need to know any of it, really. Like, I, I didn't really come into this knowing mm -hmm. anything about the Vision or the Scarlet Witch. I think the trend has been just to kind of uh, take these superhero uh, franchises, for lack of a, mm -hmm. a, a better term, um, and uh, rejiggering them for, mm, yeah. for, uh, to try to make them interesting for today's, for contemporary uh, audiences. And so, that being said, you don't really need to know any mm -hmm. Marvel history. To those of you that do know Marvel history, know these characters, know the backstory, know the silver, golden, bronze age, all of that. Um, you know, this is icing on the cake. Um, uh, to everybody else, it's, a, it's just a damn good comic, so. I think the most, the, the, the image that will last the most for me in here is uh, the maiming of the dog Sparky. Um, because I think that really gets to the heart of how these characters aren't human and yet we have empathy for them. Mm -hmm. The dog is manufactured and when he is cut, it's not blood or guts that come out, it's, you know, wires and sparks. Right. And, uh, and yet, um, I still have a... You still shed a tear. I still shed a tear, right. And, you know, this is a trope that's been going on for decades now, and yet I still think it's kind of uh, significant. But again, there's just a lot in here, and it's not just like, this book's about technology or this book's right. about society. There's, there's a lot in it, and it's a big book, and um, it's a lot of fun reading. Um, yeah, I would I recommend it. Yeah, it's pick, a good up, one. pick up the vision. Yay. Yay. So that's book one that we uh, read. Yeah. And then book two is The Case of the Missing Men. So Vision was my suggestion. Yes. Case of the Missing Men, this is Jack's mm -hmm. suggestion. Um, yeah, it's uh, by creators Chris Burton and Alexander Forbes. Uh, I believe the writer had written something in prose beforehand, but this is their first team-up graphic novel. And it's, almost, it's uh, 300 pages. It really a lot of cross hatching and really <laughs> ambitious. Yeah, yeah. And um, I was impressed. I, I yeah. So had this kind of come up with, with anything before that? Um, not like some. I mean, I believe the writer has written something before him, but this is their first comic. Yeah. Um, they are from Wolfville, Nova Scotia. I'm a little biased because that's where my grandma is from. Got to went out to grandmas. Nova Scotia every summer, right? So <laughs> I get a little bit of a nostalgic tingle reading this, but it's not. It's more than just that. As I describe this to uh, Dave, it feels like you're reading David Lynch. It, David Lynch is the author, and Edward Gorey is the illustrator. Yeah. Um, if you if you are a fan of either of those things, this is a book for you. Um, yeah, and not not knowing uh, like just. Mm -hmm. charging into it the way that um, you presented it to me. As I encountered the characters, it's a group of teenagers and they're mystery solvers, so automatically to anybody you know, our age, I think Scooby-Doo is the first thing to <laughs> pop into. They, they say Nancy Drew. Oh, Nancy yeah. Drew, okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I didn't read those. Nancy but Drew, Scooby-Doo, yeah. you know, like the teenage mystery solvers. And they have like a club at the high school. The, yeah, yeah, they do have a club at the high school. and. And then like, okay, cool, they're solving all this petty stuff, you think. But like right away it starts off with like uh, a really big town-wide mystery. It goes to some unexpected places. Like it, it gets surreal and oh, it yeah. gets dreamlike and it goes to um, supernatural-like places uh, pretty quickly. And um, it didn't feel it didn't feel out of place. Like it mm -hmm. all felt part of a, a piece, which um, which I liked. Um, a lot of the the drawing style and especially those moments reminded me a lot of Chester Brown. Hmm. Um, just kind of the the malformed species that emerges later <laughs> mid, midway through the book. <laughs> I was like, wow, this is the, this That's is. It reminded me of reading some Chester Brown. At a certain point, I was reading it. I was like, "This is this to two lynching? Is this like like is is the influence just too apparent? Is there just right. like one influence, and they're just kind of doing a copycat of it?" I guess if I was being very harsh, I could say yes. But I like David Lynch, and I like those troops, and I'll tell you why. Which is that something I kind of Lynchian juxtaposes things that are very cheesy and sweet and um, kind of artificial with things that are extremely disturbing, like right, right next to each other. 
Um, and it's like kind of like going on a roller coaster. It has like super high highs and super low lows. Yeah. Um, and as a result, everything is just polarized, and you just become more observant, and I think you become a little bit more emotionally receptive to the work um, as a result of this like extreme uh, polarizing opposites. Oh, that's intense. Yeah, because like you know, you'll be it'll be one page, and you're like reading a Nancy Drew page, yep. and it's like some charming seaside town in Nova Scotia. And you turn the page, and there's like the most disturbing corpse of a canine, like <laughs> hanging in the woods. Right. And it's like, oh my god! Right. Yeah. That that's just fun. It's like a full. It's like the full experience. Yeah. Um. I mean, I, I usually am not uh, someone who's like you know, gives so many brownie points to just to just pure uh, labor intensive work. It really helps with the transportation of it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like it's very. Uh, it's a fully realized work. You know? It really is. Yeah, you could tell that the, the co-authors spent a lot of time trying to realize these characters and realize this universe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not familiar with Nova Scotia, but um, we're here in, um, in New England, and it, it, did, it does have a sense of like those fishing towns in New England. Yeah. Um, so it's not, it's not so alien to me. Um, and to, to people who aren't familiar with those settings at all, it adds another layer to this mis uh, to the mystery, I think, because you have such a close knit yeah. community, um, and so everybody has secrets to hide. Mm -hmm. There's always stuff to hide in those kinds of communities. Um, going back to the vision, like the suburbs of North America has this is a very loaded, you know, is supposed to be pure or innocent or something, and so the cr th there's always this shock of crime in the suburbs, you right? Know? And I think that's a, something. A, that's a theme you see time and time again. Of like, how could this happen in our like Twin Peaks? It's Twin Peaks East Coast, right? You know. <laughs> well, I have this theory about like local news. Like, like yeah. no, local news is like mostly just weather and petty suburban crime, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's because like um, petty suburban crime via news outlets and detective stories have, have um, th their DNA is kind of in the same place storytelling wise, I think. Mm -hmm. And I'm going out of left field here, so bear with me. Like, um, I think that, it, it, some, I've read somewhere that detective stories, people are, people like them and people enjoy them because they uh, reinforce a sense of order. So like, like yeah, the, the detective yeah, like yeah. solves the mystery, but in the end everything is wrapped up and like, oh, you know, like maybe as humans we need that. And then so um, suburbia as a setting, just going back to the news thing and then like the, the suburban settings of these two books, um, suburbia is supposed to be some sort of idyllic yeah. thing. Um, they were originally constructed outside of cities as a place to rest some and, and play when you weren't at work. Some false frontier fake pastoral well, thing, you yeah, know, supposed to be rustic, you know. It was probably just all <laughs> developer BS, real right, estate company, manufactured, right, garbage, yeah. um, which is the same garbage that they're feeding about that are trying to get people to move back to urban cities. Mm. Um, yeah, so that sort of uh, tension with suburbia I mean, um, yeah, I mean, is in, present in both of these. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm reading it. I mean, in the case of The Missing Men, it, it might just be rural. Maybe I shouldn't even say suburbia. Like, it's it's just... There's suburban qualities suburban to it, though. Yeah. yeah. Like, um, it, it, it's kind of small town enough that it, there's definitely, like, open fields, especially yeah. where certain gruesome uh, discoveries take place. Right. I don't want to get be too critical of it, because I want you to read it, and it's good. I'm excited. This is their rookie book. Mm. And, you know, um, um, and I, I feel like this is a really great book. I can't wait to what they see, what they do next, yeah. you know? Because, like, I feel like I really hope they just keep on growing and experimenting and pushing it into their own direction. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, if I may, if I have a theory as to why it's so labor intensive, which is that winters in Nova Scotia are just brutal. So there might just be lots and lots of hours in the winter behind just it. Drunk. <laughs> just drunk. Just because, you know, what else yeah. are you going to do, you know? Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> we both make comics, and I know, like, yeah. uh, winters here in New England, they tend to be pretty productive times. Because <laughs> um, really, there's not much else to do. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and I do like I do I like the packaging. Mm -hmm. uh, the packaging is really nice. It's like Nancy Drewish. Uh, yeah. It's like very nostalgic for uh, these kinds of series of books. Even the mustard yellow. The mustard yellow. The yeah. spine. There's a number one there, which implies that there's going to be more in this 
Hobtown mystery stories series. We should bleach the edges with tea bags and then like put them in antique shops and see if people just buy them thinking they're really old. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Because I mean, I think it's going for that, you know. It looks like looks like something that could have been printed, you know, 40 years ago yeah, or something. Yeah, it's going for that look. Yeah. Definitely playing that up, and it's nice. It's a nice part of the the whole packaging of the thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so yeah, it's using the reader's nostalgia to kind of rope them into the story, and then. Um, yeah. The, the the surprises and. Um, you know, it's funny. I I didn't realize it, but both the books we read this week were playing up this idea of. The suburbs on the outside look nice and pretty and everything's normal, but deep down, yeah. there's crime. There's crime. There's murder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I learned from reading. The, uh, yeah. <laughs> Don't move to the suburbs, I guess. Um, um, the suburbs suck. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, they. I, all right. I, already went, I went into that already. Um, but oh. yeah, like the dream sequence. You just open up to like a dream sequence yeah. page, and like there's dream sequences, and then there's like there's visions that characters. Cool have. lighting too. Like this very thoughtful. Like it's very noirish. Yeah. Very uh, noir. It's very yeah. like contemporary noir. Another thing in here that's interesting is the. Do you realize that the the way they draw bad guys, like all the good guys have dots for eyes. And um, you know the the author's not really uh, giving their opinion of these characters. They're kind of drawn, um, but the bad guys are always looking hideous. Yeah, there's some uh, d there's some Chester Gould, Dick Tracy stuff happening. Yeah, there, like googly guy. eyed, like and bulging eyes. Yeah, and, and they look like monsters. Massive proportions and tiny faces and beady eyes. Yeah, they they don't even feel human. The bad guys. Yeah, and, you know. And then once you realize, you know, what's happening to, to this set of bad guys or, uh, you know, uh, to make them act the way that they do, then, then uh, you know, it makes sense why they're, they're, they're drawn a little more differently yeah. than the, uh, the more humanoid characters. Another thing that makes it very Lynchian, I think, and also it's kind of like Hergé a little bit, is that um, he puts a lot of emphasis on it being kind of painterly. Yeah. Meaning like a panel like this on 123. Like there's no, we don't need all this cross hatching. It doesn't need to be a landscape painting, but it is, you know? And there's right. a lot of panel paintings like this. And that's something that I think it makes it really Lynchian is like the focus on the aesthetics of it. Mm. Like sometimes when you're watching a Lynch film, it's like, let's stop the plot for a second and just focus in on, you know, what it looks like. Right. You know what I mean? And there's a lot of that here. I mean, you can, if I was a four year old and I didn't know how to read, I'd still like this book. Because, <laughs> like, I would be like, oh, that's a cool drawing. There's a lot right. going on. There's slot machines in the back and there's beer cans up here. Yeah. There's a portrait of a dog and a man. And there's just a lot of stimulation, you know? Yeah, it's like, it's yeah. very observed. Um, you know, yeah. you could tell that, um, that the authors have a connection to, to the setting. Um, you know, they might have grown up in a town like that. Um, you know, you can infer that from from their they're capturing this particular town. Um, yeah, and I, like you, I do have an appreciation of good renderings or careful rendering or considered renderings of of settings and how it relates to the story. Um, yeah, so there's that, and then like there's some classic noir stuff like you know low. Low camera angles mm. and like yeah. yeah creepy lighting like you said and and all of it just kind of uh, adds to the feel of this book which uh, which was a lot more fun than uh, I didn't know what to expect I was I was probably expecting something a little more straightforward mm -hmm. um, and I don't know why um, but I was happily surprised with the direction that it went yeah and yeah. and the the mystery. Um, one tiny criticism, it kind of did what I, what I don't like sometimes in, in mystery stories is like uh, there was a, a section in the middle where they were talking about action and the actions that they uh, took instead of like us seeing it as a reader. Um, and I understand that's kind of like an editing thing that you have to do as a writer. It's like, oh, you know, I just had this giant action scene. Maybe I need to slow it down with them like talking about um, some off-camera action, which, which is fine. It just felt like a particularly long scene. Hmm. That's just me being a little finicky. Yeah. Um, but on the whole, yeah, I, well, I really enjoyed I'm it. really excited to see what happens next. Um, I guess just uh, to wrap up, what are, you, what are you reading these days? 
Um, I'm here, but. Well, I'm reading a, a book. An, uh, it's a history book of America called Fantasyland oh, cool. about America's relation to fantasy and uh, how it's make what makes America really unique, but it's also extremely problematic because mm. then people stop accepting reality because <laughs> it's not really, you know. Huh. And um, it's really good, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, let's see, how, how could that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a whole other episode. I mean, that's yeah, that's a whole other show. Um, <laughs> um, that, I guess the book I'm reading now. Yeah, cool. It's good. Um, not a comic. Not a comic. Not a comic. Uh, the comic I just read. Oh, Cartoon Clouds. It's a fan graphics book. I forget the author. Um, about a bunch of people who just graduate from art school. Um, it was good. Cool. Uh, we could talk about that next week, maybe. I would be down for it. Cool. Yeah, it's good. Um, yeah. Off of Fanagraphics, Cartoon Clouds. Off of Fanagraphics. Uh, oh, by the, the, by the way, this is the first yes. time we don't review Fanagraphics yes. books for we're, those of you keeping track. We're branching out. Branching out. Yeah. We love, you know, we love Fantagraphics. We, we are, we're fans of that, those kinds of comics, obviously. But, yeah. you know, this is our first, like, uh, Marvel book, for sure. Marvel, and uh, this publisher was... Well, Conundrum Press. Conundrum Press. Acknowledges the final... And in, uh, acknowledged the financial assistance of the Canadian Council of the Arts, Government of Canada, Nova Scotia, Creative Industries Fund towards this publication. Cool. Support the Canadians. The, yeah, support, support the Canadian arts, and arts. then maybe there'll be more, like, incredibly crazy crosshatch 300-page graphic novels. There you, know? you go. Tax dollars at work. There you go. Yeah. Um, what I'm reading right now, I'm reading um, Font Bukowski, Bukowski Font Bukowski Two, which is fun. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's it, he, so speaking of poverty. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well. Yeah. Poverty maybe of self, the mind. Self, maybe. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just fun to see him take off with that character. Um, so maybe we could talk about about that sure. at some future show. Um, yeah. So this was a good like jump back into things, and hopefully we'll do this on a more regular basis. Yes, for uh, sure. Thank you all for watching, and read some comics. See you next week. <laughs>